offer praises to you. Almighty God, now and forever, you're holy and worthy to be praised. We offer praises to you. Almighty God, now and forever, you're holy and worthy to be praised. You are holy and worthy to be worshipped and adored. Yesterday, today, and forevermore, we offer praises to you, Almighty God, now and forever, you're holy and worthy to be praised. Yes, he is holy, and he is worthy to be praised, amen, because we serve an awesome God, amen, and he's worthy of our worship, amen, because he's the one that laid his life down. He gave of himself. He was our sin offering, amen, hallelujah. You are glorious with endless love. You are righteousness and truth. Mercy, peace, fear, Lord, and love the bound in you. We offer praises to you, Almighty God, now and forever, you're holy and worthy to be praised. God, now and forever, you're holy and righteous and loving and powerful and worthy to be praised. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Timothy. And um, two areas in Timothy that we'll read, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, and 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Amen. I'll give you a moment. Anyone need a Bible? Amen. Just lift your hands. The ushers will get them to you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 1 Timothy chapter 3, chapter 4, I'm sorry, verse 1, and 2 Timothy chapter 3, amen? And as we've been doing recently, amen, we'll um, read, let's read them all together, amen? All four, it's only three verses that we'll read, so let's read those together if we would. If you're there, say Amen. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, let's read. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse, let's read verse 1 and then 13 and 14. Verse 1, this know also that in the last days Perilous times shall come, but continue thou in the things which thou hast, verse 14, um, 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. My task today is to connect those. Amen. 
And there's a key word in connecting those two different texts together. You know, in the latter times, me and the depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. But then the Apostle Paul says in verse 14, but continue thou in the things, even as evil men and seducers wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, we're encouraged or exhorted or commanded, I'll say, to continue. Somebody say continue. And I'll defend this word in just a moment, but first let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, as we open up your word, we thank you, God, that your word is the word of life, is truth. Your word is our equipper. Your word produces faith. And so, God, we believe, according to Isaiah 55, 11, that this word will not return void. It'll prosper where you send it. So, Lord, as you send your word into our hearts, God, we thank you for making our hearts good soil to receive the seed of the word of God that we might grow. And for it, God, we give you praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, notice this word, continue. I want us to focus on this word, because this word is the text for the next week or so that we're going to build on. There are several different meanings for this word. One word, continue. Now, in the Greek, it's the word mino. Somebody said mino. Now, that don't mean you know. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but uh, that's how it's pronounced, mino. Now, this word has several different meanings based on where it's located in the context that we find it in. And this is what um, I'm going to build this word off of today. But first, before I even give you a topic, I want to defend this word. Because this word continue in the Greek, meno, means to stay in a given place. That's one meaning. We need to stay in a given place. Generally, when we see the word continue, we just think just keep moving on. Amen? And so, and so it also means to stay. That is one of the meanings for it in a secondary sense, to keep going forth. Don't park in one position, but the first meaning is stay in a given place or state. It also means the state of where you are. It means a relation or expectancy. So it carries the thought of uh, who you're relating to in the process of continuing it and moving on and having a hope or an expectancy in you. So this little word has a, a lot in it that we can draw from to build ourselves in our faith. It also means to abide. I remember in John 15, Jesus used, actually when he said abide in me, we, we've read this before, right? That's the same word in the Greek, meno, amen. So it means to dwell in him, to kind of place yourself in him. And then it means continue as well. Dwell, be present, remain, stand, and tarry, amen. Those are some of the meanings that we see is, is this one word and that's what I like about the Bible. Our English, we got one word for continue, just keep moving on. In the Greek, we see seven, eight, nine different applications for this one word. And our message today and next Sunday is going to be built on those different meanings. Today, um, primarily stay and continue is what we'll settle on. Amen. But, um, and so there are some things here that the apostle is telling us as we open up the word of God this morning when he says, continue thou in the things. What things? The things that thou hast learned. And so we're not to be static in our walk in our relationship with God. We're not just to hear and say amen. We're to continue in that state of what we know. Amen. We're also to, to, to stay in the place that God has planted us. We find that uh, meaning there. But he says, continue in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. It's one thing to learn. It's another thing to be, be assured that what you know is truth according to the word of God. This is why we're to be students of scripture. Amen. Hallelujah. That's why we want you to open your word and follow along with us. It's good to trust the pastor, but trust the word more. Amen. Hallelujah. And so the things that you learn, the things that you're assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. So you should not know who's ministering the word to you. The Bible does instruct us to know those that labor among us. Amen. And so coming from that knowing them, there can come a level of truth and confidence, but you need to verify the word for yourself. I find that thematic 
with some of the things that the Apostle Paul teaches in the Word. So today, I want to call this um, Continue. Somebody say continue. continue. Staying in the faith while others are falling away. And see, that's where I connect that with 1 Timothy chapter 4. The Bible says in the latter times, many would depart from the faith. Amen. And we're in the middle of these latter times where we see people drifting away from the faith. The Bible uses the word plain us. They wander away, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines or teachings or instructions of devils. Amen. And so if we're going to be that last time, that uh, army of God, that glorious church, then we've got to learn the discipline of continuing, staying where we are in Christ and not being moved away and apostatize and drift away like so many. And so when we see people saying, I, I used to believe, but, you know, now I, I don't. I used to be. And, you know, the Bible says they went out from us because they were not of us in some respect. But then there are literal believers who have been deceived away from the faith. And that's the operation of seducing spirits. And so they wine and dine them with um, mental and philosophies that sound good. But if we don't have a basis in the word of God, if our foundation isn't right, if it's not rooted and grounded on the rock of the word of God, you and I, if we don't watch it, we could find ourselves adrift. And so Paul here is warning, as he often does, and he's using it by com commanding um, this church that he's writing to to continue in what they've learned and been assured of. And so that's why I call it continuing the faith as others are falling away. Now, one of the first things we need to continue in doing, if you go to Hebrews 10, 25, the Bible says they're forsaken not. The assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. But the more as you see that they are approaching. So the Holy Spirit knew and he penned it by, I believe, the Apostle Paul that in the latter times due to persecution that's arising against the church. See the setting that this book is written in. All of a sudden, there are people who were birthed into Judaism, raised into Judaism, uh, they knew the law. They kept the ordinance of the word of God. They kept the Sabbath, as it were. But all of a sudden, there comes this new thing, this new gospel, first called the way, and this group called the sect, the Christians. And all of a sudden, people who were birthed into the kingdom of God came out of Judaism, and they faced persecution from those who were still Jews in the faith, Judaism, as it were. And so sometimes that persecution was harsh and they were pressured to go back and to go back from the new life in Christ and go back under the system of laws and commandments and ordinances. And, and Paul is talking to his people. They're pressured to do that. Imagine if some of us, when you, got first, when you first got saved, how many of y'all were the first one in your family to get saved? Amen. Did you ever have somebody in your family try and, and draw you back to where you were? You know, well, why you got to leave your church? You grew up here. Mom and dad was here. You know, but God's calling you out to go somewhere else. They can put a little pressure on you, can't they? Amen. Well, why you got to believe all of that? You don't have to do all that to serve God. How many of y'all heard that before? In other words, these things, if people don't understand, if they're not wholly sold out to Jesus, you've seen people go back. And they've retreated and gone back to their old manner of life to please people. This is somewhat like the pressure they're under, under here. And so the apostle is writing to them, and he's encouraging them not to forsake to assemble together. Amen. All of a sudden, you know, they've, they've been meeting on the Sabbath, which is Saturday, and now they're meeting on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. No, no, you don't have to do that. You can just come and meet with us on this day. That's all you have to do according to the law. And he's telling them, do not forsake to assemble together. Amen? Amen? But then he said, as the manner of some is. So some are already not assembling even in the New Testament church. So some are beginning to fall away and saying, 
I, and people are saying that right now. I don't see why you have to come to church during COVID. You can serve God at home. Yeah, they'll give you that excuse in a, in a New York minute, won't it? Now, we need to assemble. Look at your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, we need to assemble. Amen. Now, notice here he said, forsaken, not forsaken the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. We know the sums. So I'm going to call them the sums, you know. They say, well, I don't see why you should do that. You know, what if somebody gets sick because you came to church? As if that's the only place. Amen. Amen, you know. It's funny that you can go protest and nothing is said, but if you go to church, they say, you could cause a super sale. See, those are works of the enemy to try and keep us from a vital thing we've been told to do. There are reasons why the Bible instructs us to assemble. And we'll go over some of those in just a moment. And so he says we're not to forsake this. We're to continue in this. This is something we have learned. And so when we go back to 2 Timothy 4, um, we see here, or chapter uh, 3, we see that these are things that we have learned, that the Bible teaches us the importance of the local assembly. Amen? And so he didn't tell us to uh, stop assembling, uh, stop the assembly because of COVID. He didn't tell us to stop the assembly because a governor. Amen. Amen. He said, don't forsake it even when there's pressure on you not to assemble. Amen. Amen. Why? Because there's some vital things to be done in it. Amen. So this word assemble means to put yourselves together to meet. And so we're to put ourselves in a place where we come together and there are reasons why we need to come together. So we are to assembly. Amen. Assemble or to put ourselves together, which means if you and I in the body of Christ as individual sheep come together comprising a flock, this is the flock of Harvest Christian Fellowship, and there are different flocks all over the city, the nation, and around the world. What he says to those, don't forsake to assemble together as a manner of some is, but more. Rather than decrease, we need to increase as we see that they are approaching because as the pressures mount from outside externally on us and the pressures are generated from within not to do this if we don't settle it in our hearts the reasons why we do we could be convinced to do it and forsake assembling again amen see this is one of the reasons why we take this stance as a church um, that we will assemble because the bible tells us to amen amen Hallelujah. And we all obey God and not man. Acts 5, 29. Amen. Now, we gave it a little grace in the beginning until we found out they were trying to manipulate us. But once you start playing games, we stop playing the game. Amen. Amen. If it was a legitimate need to continue, then if you're honest, yeah, I can roll with that. But when you start lying and it comes to the point where we don't obey God or you, then you out. Amen. See, there are some things we need to be resolute in. You don't have to do, you can't, you know, you can, you can get sick in other places other than church. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And so we, we, we need to take our place on the word of God. So we need to stay in place. Amen. One of the meanings of the word continue. And the assembly can't be done in isolation. You can't, you can't assemble in isolation. When a church is meeting, well, we're meeting on land. Well, no, that's a substitute. That's not an assembly. Amen. Amen. See, sometimes we'll make the, now nothing, you can use the substitute. It can have value. And, and, and we put the word out on land as well. But that is not a substitute for us coming together. Amen. Amen. You know, sheep by nature are herd animals. The Bible didn't tell us to unherd. Amen. You know, so by nature, we run in flocks, don't we? And also because of our nature to run in flocks, there's a strength that comes when we're together. It's often, you know, I no notice sometimes even when I'm watching something as simple as a, uh, you know, if we have family night and we show a movie or, or we do a presentation, I can watch it at home and be blessed by it. But there's something different when we see the same thing when we assemble. Anybody notice that other than pastor? Amen. You begin, you know, see, there's something else. There's that corporate anointing when we assemble together. 
Amen. And so there's that mutual increase in our faith where one puts to flight a thousand and two ten thousand. Matter of fact, isolation is a form of, of um, psychological warfare. You know, you know, one of the things that prisoners can get put in when they don't obey is isolation as a form of punishment. And psychologically, it damages people. So we'll be dealing with the effects of isolation going down the road after this is behind us. And if some have their way, it'll never be, be totally behind you. They want this to become a way of life. So we need to be understanding in what's going on. But the Bible tells us to assemble, doesn't it? Amen. As sheep and flocks under a shepherd. Now, Jesus is the chief shepherd. Amen. I'm an under shepherd. Amen. But we're to assemble. Now, why do we assemble? Well, number one, amen, we assemble for fellowship, mutual fellowship. You know, the Bible tells us concerning the assembly, the fellowship of the saints, the word fellowship in the Greek is the word koinia, and it means a, um, a partnership together. We're, we're co-laborers in the gospel. We're partners together with Jesus, amen, in the administration of his word. That's one of the works of pastoring, but it's also part of what you do. We're partners, aren't we? Amen. Another definition for that word is the word that we get the word intercourse from. And, and it's not in a sexual sense. It's a commingling of one another individuals as we draw mutual faith and encouragement from one another. In other words, it means that we're in a close, a close relationship whereby we learn one another. We can have discernment about one another. When one of you are, are, are struggling, maybe one of us in the assembly can sense that and, and come alongside you and, and build you and encourage you along the way. You can't do that in isolation. Amen? Now, I can call you and still be a blessing, amen, but it's not the same as being able to uh, have that touch. There's power in touch, isn't it? If it wasn't the Bible, it wouldn't say lay hands on the sick. You can't lay hands on the sick that you can't see. You can't anoint them with oil if you can't touch them. Amen. Now, there's power in prayer at a distance. Amen. But we're also to gather and pray and lay hands on the sick. Amen. Somebody say for fellowship. So we assemble for fellowship. Amen. Another reason why we assemble Amen. Notice verse 24 in Hebrews 10. And consider one another to provoke one another unto love and good works. Amen. Now, he goes on and then in the 25th verse, he uses another word called exhorting. So we come together to be exhorted. Well, what's that? That word literally means an invitation. It means an encouragement. Um, and so we come together to give encourage, encouragement, to be encouraged, and we invite one another for that reason. And so that's what, so you can actually go from that word and say, yeah, it's okay to inv invite folk to church. Amen. You know, exhort them, encourage them to come. Well, I don't know. You know, they saying, well, come on, you know, you know, God is here. Amen. He said, where two or three gather in my name, there am I. Now I know he's with you always, but in demonstration and manifestation in his presence, amen, you know, is with us corporately as well as a group. Amen. Hallelujah. So, so we come for edification and encouragement, don't we? We build one another in our, in our faith together, amen. I get encouraged when I see you, amen. In other words, there's something when we come together, when I see your lovely face, amen. When I see you smiling, it's a praise the Lord, amen. Praise God. It is good. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord, amen. You know, you know, sometimes it's a struggle to get to church in it, on time, amen. You know, stuff come up, doesn't it? Amen, you know, it, but when you get there, when you have to push your way through and you're greeted, amen, and you come on a lot and you see Brother Welch out there, that big smile, and amen, you get to the door and, and someone greets you as you come in and praise God, amen. And all of a sudden there's a lift and see, you can't get that at a distance. Amen. And so we need to assemble and provoke and encourage one another to continue in assembly in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Another reason why we're to assemble together is for discipleship. Amen. A lot of people say, well, uh, we're disciples. Well, a disciple, uh-oh, that same word, Mino again, in John 8, 32, says if you continue in 
the word. Amen. Same word that he uses here. Amen. Uh, for, for continue, Paul used earlier. Same word. So if we continue the word, then, you know. And so a disciple is not a part-time student of the word of God. A disciple is one who's involved in learning the discipline. Part of what we're to discipline ourselves in, in the not forsaken to assemble, is the discipline Sunday is our day. <laughs> you, know, you know, he said, I was glad, the psalmist said, when I went with them to the house of the Lord, with them that kept holy day. Amen. So we've set a day apart. Amen. And we're going to assemble together and meet so we can sit together under the word of God and be fed. And so as a disciple, I discipline myself to that. And once you develop the discipline, even if you're not here, you're on vacation, you're still going to fellowship somewhere. Why? Because it's what we do. Amen. You know, and so it's part of who we are. As sheep, we know that at feeding times, we come because we've disciplined ourselves. Even if it means I need to start winding stuff down on Saturday so I can be up and ready on Sunday. Amen. Amen. See, we operate under discipline, don't we? And so that's what a disciple is, a disciplined learner. Amen. As a disciple, that means that you don't not just read the word when you feel like it. You don't just go to the word for your inspirational quote for the day. Amen. No, you discipline yourself. I need this. I need your word more than my necessary bread. Amen. I found your words and your word was life unto me and health to all my flesh. A disciple goes to the word by discipline, not by feeling. And so part of what we learn through the discipline of assembly is to become a disciplined student of the word of God. Amen. Amen. Not just when we assemble, but when I'm at home, I can discipline myself to read and study the word of God. You know, and that, and, but when I come together, we sharpen one another, don't we? You know, that's why Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpened iron, so a man the countenance of his friend. When we assemble together, man, how are you doing? And we begin to discuss the word together. And you begin to share the insight you're gleaning from Scripture. And I share what I'm learning from Scripture. We begin to sharpen one another, don't we? Amen? You know, so these are reasons why we assemble. Amen? We come to church to be fed. Now, ultimately, you know, you can spread the table, but it's up to you to eat. Amen? Nobody can eat for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, if you spread the table, I have no problem eating. Amen. Well, we need that same mentality with the word of God. Amen. You know, that we're ready to feed. And so we show up on Sunday, we're ready to eat. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, and so the Bible commands us. Amen. I'm going to read this scripture. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, and this is what the, um, Peter is telling the elders, amen, and, and uh, he says, feed the flock of God which is among you. See, a pastor or under-shepherd primarily is to be a feeder, amen? Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by force or co compulsion, but willingly, not for filthy lucre or for money, but of a ready man. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but as being examples to the flock. And so, you know, so if you're going to look you, uh, at people who are serving God in a capacity of ministry, we're not just a position, we're called to be an example. Amen? And so, but we need to be fed. So don't forsake to assemble, to eat. Now, how many of y'all like to eat by yourself all the time? No, it is the family gather around the table. Amen. So that's a different thing there, isn't it? Now, I eat by myself, but it's better when we eat together. And so when we assemble on for service, amen, and we open and feed on the word of God together, praise God, it's good going. Amen? Oh, but then again, there's this correction that we assemble for. Amen? Going back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you learn anything, say amen. Now, not only did he say continue on in verse 14, verse 15 he says, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. Amen. Now, in the 16th verse, he tells you what the scriptures are for. All scriptures are God-breathed, 2 Timothy 3, 16. 
divinely inspired by God and is profitable. Say profitable. All the scriptures of God breathed to profit me, to benefit me. Well, what are they profitable for? And so this is why we assemble. They're profitable for doctrine. That's simply instruction on how to live. Amen. We find that in the word of God, but it's also profitable for what's the other word? Amen. Correction. You know that word correction, epinostasis, it means to straighten you up. That's all it means. Amen. See, we're similar to get straightened up, straightened out. Amen. Or we'll phrase it like this, you know, man, that word God has stepped on my toes today. Well, that's to straighten you up. <laughs> Amen. You know, <laughs> you know, so, so when we're similar, God is going to straighten out things in our lives. It's amazing. Sometimes people say, Pastor, what you, you preach was what God had been dealing with me about, you know. And then I'll joke and say, well, you know, Pastor, preach what you're praying about. Amen. But, but literally, literally, seriously, the Bible is to straighten us out. So give us instruction and tell us how to do it right. Amen. We'll go back and pick all of those different aspects out in just a little bit. But um, it's given to help us to get it right. Amen. You know, a lot of people have forsaken and fallen away from the word because they're not willing to be corrected. Well, I know I know I, this is what well, what does the Bible say? What well, I believe. What does the Bible say? See, the Bible will correct us. And our part in being corrected is to be submitted to the word of God, first and foremost. Amen. Hallelujah. And that's my next continue. We need to be continuing in submission to godly leadership. Amen. You know, in Joshua chapter five, I'm not going to turn there. Joshua was preparing for battle. And along the way, you know, he saw someone in front of him and he said, are you for God, uh, for us or against us? And he mentioned that he was the commander of the Lord's host. Actually, it was a, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. In Joshua 5, 15, he kneeled and he bowed to him in worship. And he told him, take your shoes off for where you stand is holy, just like Moses. In other words, Joshua recognized that, you know, his first submission, as we should, is to our commander in chief, Jesus. He's the captain of the Lord's host. Now, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 13, 7 and the 17th verse that we're to be in submission to godly leadership. But our first submission is to Jesus, our commander in chief. Amen. Why is that so important? Because the words that are put here in the word for us are the words of our commander. Amen. He's the one that orchestrated what's put here. He told us what to do about life, what to believe about life, what to believe about family, what to believe about di different situations as they come. And as I submit to him and his word, then he, let God be true in every man a liar. Amen. So if I'm going to continue on in the things I'm learning, make sure that you're in submission to the word of your commander in chief, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Why? Because there's a tendency more and more in the world to make substitutions for the authority of God's word. And so we need to be on guard so that we don't substitute our feelings or our opinions for what God said. Now, that may not be where you are, but it's something you need to always be on the watch for. And it's so subtle. Somebody said, well, I'm reading this in the Bible. Now, this is my interpretation. Who gave you that authority? The word says of itself, it's not of a private interpretation. Now, by the uh, um, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we can see different aspects of the word of God, you know, different sides of the word of God, but it always agrees with the word of God. You, lots of times when somebody say that, their interpretation in what the Bible's saying. Y'all know pastors right there, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Romans 3, 4 says, let God be true and every man a liar. So how we interpret needs to always be in line then with the co what the commander in chief said. There's not my interpretation, it's his. What did God say? And see, when people begin to substitute for what God says, then they redefine the family. They redefine when life is and what it begins because they interpret the Bible based on their philosophy and not um, what the commander said. Amen. So our second area of 
continuing is continue in submission. Remember when you used to be on, so fire, on fire for God that whatever God said, it didn't matter what people said. No, 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 the Bible said we need to either get back there and stay there. Amen? See, that's another meaning for a continue, stay in the place. Amen? Don't move from the place of putting this word first place. Amen? No, because the Bible says he has exalted his word above all his name, Psalm 138 too. Amen. So God is going to honor his word. We need to give the word priority, don't we? Amen. So we need to continue in submission to godly leadership. First, the Lord Jesus Christ, and then those that God has set um, in different positions of leadership in the body of Christ. Amen. That's the conditional authority. I mean, submission. Now, submission to Jesus is without condition. Whatever our commander in chief says, that's so. Amen. Our, con our submission to men and women who are over us in, let's say, a pastoral eldership capacity is conditioned on them being in agreement with the commander in chief. See, if we'll get this right, no preacher would ever be able to lead people astray from the scripture if we put the scriptures above the word of an individual. See, this is why we need to continue first submitting to the word of our commander. Yeah, that sounds good, but that's not what Jesus said. Amen. If it's not what Jesus says, don't you run with it. Amen. Hebrews 13, 7 says, remember them which have the rule. Then that word rule is guide over you. Amen. Who have spoken unto you the word of God. So remember those who are guiding you and speaking unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. So you should be able to follow our faith considering, see, this is why I said this is conditional. No one should have been able to have been led astray by Jim Jones. Amen. The minute he strayed from Scripture, Christians strayed with him. You know, no, it says considering the end of their conversation or their lifestyle, how they live. So if any man or a woman is over you, to speak unto you the word of God and they're not walking according to the word of God, you don't have to follow them where they're going. Amen. Amen. You know, you're not going into error with them. Amen. Why? He says, consider the end. So you need to watch those. That's why the Bible says, know those that labor among you. Consider the end of their manner of life, their lifestyle or conversation. Amen. Are they, are they representing Jesus when they speak the word? Are they guiding you to, to the word of God and con and, and exalting the word and what Jesus said above their opinion. Amen. Remember them. Follow the faith, not the individual. Amen. Amen. And when they stop following Jesus, you cease to follow them. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Notice verse 17. Obey them that have the guide. That word rule means guide over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account. If someone is really in a position of oversight, especially in the church, a shepherd, as it were, we should be very careful what we say and what we preach. Because we're going to give an account for it, but also the hearer is going to give an account for what they heard. But if we really watch over what we preach, knowing that people might actually believe it, it ought to add some structure and some care to what we say. Amen. We should watch. We should never go outside of the word of God. But we're to be watchful for your souls as they that must give an account that they must do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So we need to submit to godly leadership and go with them as long as they're in submission to the Lord Jesus. Christians should not follow people into error. By the way, it means as a disciple, you know your word. And then you're led by the Spirit of God. Sometimes people can use the word deceitfully. And sometimes you will know it. And say, I know that scripture, but something just don't, it's not something, it kind of don't fit right. It's, it's all out of context or it's something gnawing at you on the inside. How, how many experienced that before? Don't move. <laughs> Amen. See, the Holy Spirit prompts us. Amen. He might not come out and say, whoa. But it's like something on the inside of you is going, whoa, don't move. Amen. Don't run with it. Amen. Don't get ahead of God. Amen. Amen. Your neighbor and say, continue. 
Amen. What else can I continue in? We well, need to continue in love with Jesus. Now, remember one of the words is stay for a continue. We need to stay in love with Jesus. Remember when you first got saved and everything that walked by you told about Jesus. Amen. You couldn't wait to go to the word. Matter of fact, some of us, and you know, I remember when I used to, man, going to church one time on Sunday wasn't enough. Amen. We just running, 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 running. Amen. So I'm running for my Lord. Amen. Everywhere, that, you know, man, in the morning, in the afternoon, in between that, reading your word. Y'all remember when we were like that? What happened? We might not have to, now we're more settled in our life, we're more disciplined, but we should still stay at that place of love in Christ. Amen? We should love him, not less, but more. Amen? But there are some discipline required to stay. Now, in Matthew 24, Jesus made this statement pertaining to the last days. In Matthew 24, 12, he said, And because iniquity shall abound or increase, the love of many shall wax cold. There are things that work against us continuing on in the love of Jesus. Pressure, persecution, the things of this world, distractions, amen, you know, can work against us and kind of drain our love. You know, in the church in Ephesus, in Revelation 2, 4, you know, the church that was known for their trying those that were false and searching them out. He said, yet I have one thing against you, that you've left your first love. So, saints, we need to be on guard that we continue in our first love. Amen? Amen. What we put in preeminence or first place in our lives needs to remain Jesus. Amen? Amen. We need to love Jesus more than our spouses. We need to love Jesus more than our church. Amen. We need to love Jesus more than our bosses. More than other people. Why? Anything I love more than Jesus or give higher preeminence than Jesus, Satan can use to comprom compromise my serving Jesus. Amen. That's why some people go back when others turn back. Our attitude need to be, though, none go with me. I will follow, you know. You know. See, we love Jesus, you know, just like we love somebody, you know, you want to spend time with them, don't you? And it's not a drudgery, is it? Oh, man. Even before he met, man, I, I, I think I'm a married out, and I guess I need to go see him tonight. No, that's not how you act when you're in love, when you're courting, is it? Man, you calling them all during the day, you know. Can I come over? Y'all remember y'all used to do that? What you doing later? You, you want to be with them. Amen. You know, we, you know, that same zeal we used to have for Jesus, we need to go back and pick it up, don't we? And continue in it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, he even tells us how to go back and restore that first love. He said, repent and do the first works. Now, what did I do when I first got saved? Did I stop doing when I really had that fire and zeal? Hmm? Studied. Amen. I devoured that word then. Amen. And so I, you know, nobody had to make me. I wanted to read the word. As newborn babes, I desired the sincere milk of the word that I might grow thereby. But then we get a little more sophisticated. You know, I, you know, I got, no, you don't never get it. You know, you know, we're in the process of learning. Amen. And so whenever we think we've arrived, no. Amen. Let him that Stand it, take heed, lest he fall. Amen. We are going to constantly learn. Amen. So he kind of shows us more as we go. And so we need to spend time in Scripture. Amen. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. So we take that. It's not a heavy yoke. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's a light burden when you want to do it. So when we want to spend time in the Word, when we want to spend time fellowshipping with Jesus, amen, then we do it. And he said, because iniquity, sin would abound. The love of many would become cold. 
So that lets us know that we need to be on guard, that we not be distracted by the seeing that is around us so that our love of Jesus becomes cold. See, our people that have lost the love, that, yeah, yeah, it's easy not to assemble. It's easy not to read, to study the word of God because we fall into the trap that we can fall into when we're married. The trap of familiarity. In other words, we, we can begin to take Jesus for granted. Well, you know, he said he, he would never leave me, so I know he's here. Now, we would never say that, will we? Amen. But we can take the Lord for granted. That's why some people never call on God until they got a need. See, this is part of correction. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah, we can call him in the day of trouble, and he'll be there. But we take him for granted if that's the only time we call on him. Amen? So how do I fall back in love with Jesus? I got to spend time with him. I got to go back and redevelop the discipline of seeking him. Amen? Uh, develop the discipline of, you know, prayer. Sometimes it's joy, but sometimes it's work. Because our flesh don't want to do that, do it. Amen? Sometimes we have to make ourselves because we need to. But the Bible says it's one of the ways we build up ourselves in our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Luke 18, 1 says, men are always to pray and not think. Amen. But I'm not talking in that sense right now. I'm talking about the sense of us learning to spend time. You know, I'm too busy to wait on the Lord. Well, no wonder why you weep. See, Isaiah 40, verse 29 and 31 talks about people getting weary and fainting. But they that wait upon the Lord, see, we can sing the song, shall renew their strength. They that wait, they that attend as a menial servant, that come and just say, Lord, I'm just here, whatever you want, Lord, speak to me. I, I just want to know what you, you got to say. Speak to me, Lord. Remember we used to do that? Amen. And, and, and then your flesh start get down there and you start waiting. And, and then the enemy said, well, ain't nothing happening here. You may, <laughs> but you push on through. And then God speaks to your heart, amen, and you get refreshed. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Amen. So as we begin to develop and, and rekindle that desire to get in God's presence, he strengthens us. We renew our strength. We mount up with wings as eagles. We shall run and not be weary. Well, what, what is that? Why is it that comparison there to an e eagle? Well, because eagles go through a process as they age where they get a little frazzled. Y'all ever seen a, most of us didn't grow up on a farm or most of us didn't grow up around chickens. But you know that chickens go through a season of what we call molting. They lose their feathers. You know, when they talk about a plucked chicken, that's when this, yeah, yeah. How many of y'all ever seen a, a chicken do that before? Well, see, at that point in stage, they're vulnerable. They're exposed, aren't they? Well, eagles go through a process where they actually shed their feathers, amen, and they stop eating, you know, and those feathers, they come back and their youth is renewed. This is what the Bible is talking about here. You know, they that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings as eagles, then they'll be weary. They call it literally renewing their youth. Now, there are times where we need to get back to fasting in. Hmm. Waiting on the Lord in prayer, and in fasting so we can renew our strength in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So <clears throat> we're talking about continuing or staying in love with Jesus. Don't take his love for granted. Don't put other stuff ahead of him. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Repent and do the first works. Go back and start spending time with him again. And so we need to continue. The Bible warns us in Jude 121 where he says, keep yourselves in the love of God. So that means I can fall out of it. God will never stop loving me, but if we're honest, our love can grow cold or we wouldn't have been warned about it. Amen. The last thing I want to say about that is in John 15 where he says, abide in me. Amen. See, if this is where we derive our strength. Now, we are bad in him. 
I remember as a new Christian, you know, this is one thing that I remember working so hard to try and learn to do. Amen. Because he said, I'm the true van. But he said, my father is the husbandman. Now, if we want to bear fruit for Jesus, we got to learn to abide in him. See, we need to continue on in this. Stay there. Verse 4, he says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. See, the Holy Spirit is in us. He produces, produces in us the fruit of the Spirit of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is all those things, love, joy, peace, patience. Yeah, but we need to abide in him because we draw strength from him because our fruit is only produced to the extent that we abide in him. So if we stray too far, we cease to produce fruit. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the van. No more can ye, except you abide in me. The word abide there simply means dwell. Stop, pause, take some time. I'm the van. You are the branches. He that abided in me and I in him. The same bring it forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Amen? Amen. So we need to de develop, redevelop that discipline. You know, now, if you're sheltered in and hunkered down and you use that time to abide in him, then it could be productive. But the Bible warns us, continue. We need to stay in that place. Mino. Say Mino again. Amen. amen. Continue to stay in a given place in Christ. Amen. That, and so as I continue on in him, he said in verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. So we need to abide in the word of God too, don't we? The words are what Jesus spoke. Jesus is the word made flesh, but the one who, who became flesh told us what to believe about life. He said, if my words abide in you, then ye shall ask what you will. Why? Because then I know how to ask. I know how to pray. I know how to come in faith. Amen? Hallelujah. And then I'm going to get ready to close on this. Amen. Stay in the word. Number one, the word for continue means stay. Amen. Stay in the word of God. I want to go back to 2 Timothy 3. We need to stay in the word. Don't get caught up in vain philosophy. Stay in the word of God. Amen. Why? Verse 16 again. Verse 15 first. Now, notice what he says here concerning this. But continue, that's the same word, mino. Thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured, assured of, knowing of them of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, the sacred writings, as it were. What do they do for? Here's why we need to stay in the word. Number one, they make you wise unto salvation. Now, how did faith for salvation come by you hearing the word of God? That you heard that there was a God who loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son for you. That if you would believe in him, you would not perish, but have everlasting life. It made you wise unto salvation. Amen. Now, after you're saved, the word makes you wise to salvation too. Now, what's salvation? It's the word, it means safety, wholeness, deliverance. Deliverance comes through the word of God. Safety comes in knowing the word of God. Amen. And so the word of God is able to make us wise even after we get saved unto deliverance. You and I as believers can be in bondage until we know what the Bible says. Amen. I remember when I used to believe that um, God used bad things to teach me. Now he can teach me through bad things, but the Holy Spirit is my teacher. Amen. I used to think that God caused bad things to come my way to humble me. And then I found out, wait a minute, the Bible says I humble myself under the mighty hand of God. See, that sounds small, but that is crucial. Because if you think God is bringing stuff into your life and beating up on you to humble you, you can get angry and offended at God and drift away. We've seen people do that. Amen? No, you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he exalts you in due time. I remember when I used to believe that when, when people passed, I thought that God, you know, that he took them. Now, if they're a believer, he received them. But God doesn't use sickness and disease to get people attention. How many of us heard that? You know, God trying to get your attention. Where is that in the Bible? 
See, this is where we need to put the word first. Amen. Amen. You won't find a scripture said that God brought stuff on. He put no, 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 no. The Bible says, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. It's the goodness of God that lead it to repentance, the Bible says. See, it's the revelation of a good God who loves you that draws you. Y'all see what I'm saying? See, that makes you wise unto deliverance. When we're delivered by renewing our mind from wrong thinking, then we can serve the Lord better. Amen? Amen. You know, if God took them to teach them, they didn't get a chance to learn because they died. Mm. I can learn by watching what you go through. Sometimes I go through things by my decisions and God can teach me through it. But we need to remember it's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Amen? He said, I've come that you might have life and that more abundantly. Amen? So we grow to where we can discern and measure by the word of God what's coming our way. The word making us wise unto deliverance. Amen? Thank God, amen, for being delivered from old mindsets and bad thinking. Amen? My Bible study teacher told me one time that when bad stuff happened, God was under me, called an humble path. I got happy and rejoiced over humble path until I saw, well, wait a minute, you humble yourself under God's mighty hand. See what I'm saying? People can say things that sound good. In the natural, they can latch on to us, but it's the word that sets us free. Amen? So we need to stay in and with the word of God because it makes us wise so we can be delivered. Amen. And notice, wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture. Say all scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, by inspiration of the spirit of God and is profitable. Now let's define these few things as in closing. And it's profitable for doctrine, which we say is instruction in righteousness. Amen. It can also mean evidence or proof. The word of God is his own best defense, amen. That's why we reason with the word of God, not with vain philosophies. The word of God is able to equip us with right knowledge, amen. The Bible says God's people perish for a lack of knowledge in Hosea 4 and 6. So the word gets us right. <clears throat> but it also says the word of God is profitable for reproof. Somebody say reproof. Amen. Now, reproof is simply proof. That's all it is. Amen. So the word of God is good for instruction. It's good for evidence and reproof. It's good for correction, as we said earlier. Amen. Which means it's straightening us up. Amen. But another meaning for this word is tutorage. The word is our teacher, isn't it? So if you want to know what God's opinion is on something, go to the word and find it. Amen. The word is our tutor. It's our educator. Amen. And so uh, the word educates us. So the most important ed education we need is a biblical education. If we get educated biblically, we know how to think as it relates to life. Amen. Notice also it says for instruction. It's profitable for instruction, how to keep it right. Tells you how to get it right. Tells you how to keep it right. We need godly instruction from Scripture, don't we? Amen. The Word of God tells us what's right and wrong, what we should and should not do, how we should think, the Bible tells us, so we can stay right for instruction in righteousness. Amen. You're back to how to live right. What's right and just in the sight of God. And so all of these things that we see in the world around us that are unrighteous, the Bible tells us what righteousness is. Amen? Hallelujah. And then verse 17, it says that you may be complete. This is where God wants to take us. So this is what the Word of God is for. When we talk about staying in the Word of God so that God can bring us to a place of perfection, the word teleon means completeness. There's another phrase after that that says thoroughly furnished or equipped. So the word of God is given us to equip us. Amen. When I think of equipping, I think of the armor of God. Amen. The word of given so we'll be equipped 
unto all good works. Amen. And so when we come together in the general assembly, when we purpose not to forsake our assembly together, these are just few of the reasons. Amen. Now, uh, in closing, going back to Hebrews 10, 35, now if we forsake to assemble, the word forsake means desert. And the word AWOL is what I think of. See, a lot of Christians absent without leave. Amen? And so you can't be thoroughly furnished and equipped if you don't show up. Amen? If you don't show up to basic training, you can't be instructed on enduring hardness as a good soldier. Amen. See, God's raising up an army, isn't he? And see, going forth, you and I, we need to be hardened. We need to be. Now, some of us have been battle tested. Amen. And there's some fights ahead. If we hadn't hardened ourselves for, you can get knocked aside. Amen. You know, we're about to enter into some really contentious times in the world. Now, I'm not saying that to discourage anybody because. The Bible tells us when we see these things, we're to lift up our heads. Our, our redemption is drawing nigh. Amen? But if you can be shaken, you will be shaken in the days to come. And God has wanted us thoroughly furnished and equipped and so that we won't be shaken because Hebrews 12, 28 says, only that which cannot be shaken will remain. You and I are called to be those who have dug deep and and laid our foundation on the rock, on the rock of God's word, so that when the shaking increases, we've seen shaking this year thus far, but there's other shaking yet to come. And God is equipping us so that when the shaking increases, you and I, we won't be caught, tossed to and fro as James described, and driven of the wind. No, we will have dug deep, and our anchor is in the rock. The rock is Jesus and his word. And our house will not fall because it's founded on a rock. This is what God is doing in us. And he's doing it through assembling us and equipping us with his word so that we'll be ready in the event that we're called to stand, if need be, stand alone. So we're in preparation in the name of Jesus. Continue in the faith. Amen. Hallelujah. I'll just throw this out. I'll pick back up on this next week. We're about to close. Amen. But he says, if you continue in Jude 1, 3, in the faith, that word mino once again, we're so often encouraged to continue on, saints. God is trying to speak to us, not to cave in and toss, and don't, don't uh, some of us going through some stuff in your life, but don't toss in the tower yet, amen? No, you got to stand fast in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. amen. And so, you need to contend for your faith. Battle instructions for these days. Continue steadfast in the faith. Contend, Jude 1, 3, earnestly for the faith. And um, in 1 Timothy 6 and 12, the Apostle Paul says, I have kept the faith. I have finished my course. This is what we're going to pick up at next week. That part of our battle um, uh, plan, the encouragement from the Lord Jesus if we're going to stay in a place, we're going to continue, we got, got to be willing to contend. Amen? That means when the road gets bumpy, you know, we're not going to turn tail and run. We committed in this. Matter of fact, when you understand the armor of God, when you shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel, under those, those shoes were, that Roman sandal was somewhat like cleated, but they sort of clawed back. They were built so you could stand, but they didn't support you when you were in retreat. It gave you a sure footing when you stood and advanced. Because as God's people, we're never to be in retreat mode. The Bible tells us, having done all, stand. Well, you sound a strategic retreat. No, stand. And having done all, stand, stand therefore. Having the armor of God on. Amen. So no matter what we see, no matter what comes our way, no matter what ways come, how rocky it get, if they're rioting in the street, rioting in front of your house. Amen. You're going to stand. Amen. Glory to God in Jesus' name. Father, we ask you to bless us, build us up. 
Help us, God, to continue on in the things that we have learned and heard, God, in the name of Jesus. God, help us to be good soldiers, good footmen and footwomen, in the name of Jesus. Help us, God, to sound no retreat, but to stand boldly in the faith in the name of Jesus. For God, we give you praise and thanks, God. Help us to contend earnestly for the faith that was once delivered to the saints, God, in the mighty name of Jesus. God, we praise you for it. God, we ask you to birth in us a fresh desire, yearning, God, to draw near to you, Lord, to seek you. Fresh desire, God, to read and study your word. God, open your scriptures even more to us in Jesus' name and help us, God, even more as we see that day approaching to forsake not to assemble ourselves together, that we might show up to feed, that we might show up, Lord, to go forth as disciples in Jesus' name. And for that, God, we give you praise, we give you honor, Lord, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.